the summer of 2013. He was calling me January 2014. The thing is, it worked, and I'm great, and I feel wonderful. I just am lonely because I don't know people doing this, and I understand you might have some patients you've been educating, and the truth is I've been doing that for decades. And we got together, had a cup of tea in my uh, kitchen table, and we said, let's get a room, let's be crazy, let's get a little room at Beaumont Hospital, put out one little ad in a local newspaper, and see if we can get 15 or 20 people interested in a support group. Kind of a you know, Weight Watchers, AA, kind of church-based, whatever you want to call it, support group. And for those of you that weren't there, and I was, the room that holds 80 at Beaumont, we had 136 people, and maybe I'm off by a couple show up. It actually violated the fire code. Um, it was insanely interesting on a snowy, very, very treacherous February night. The hospital administration was a little concerned because they hadn't really approved the agenda, and there were way too many people. They let us do it one more time the next month. And the next month, about 150 people showed up. And they ended our relationship with that hospital because we violated the fire code. And we were talking about healing disease with nutrition. And that's not even now in 2020 always well accepted in a hospital. And graciously, this high school and other high school accepted us. But if you would have asked us then, would this grow to 7,000 members and cookbooks and cooking classes and prominent speakers and internationally known speakers? I mean, it's phenomenal. I'm, there's no doubt about it. I, I kicked a little in the beginning to get it going. And Paul Chatlin, the volunteers, now Lisa Smith, the board, now um, Dr. Brakey and such. Carolyn Trapp has been here from day one. It, there is no city in the United States that has what we have. We're hoping they all get it, and Paul Chatlin's working on that, and you know Chicago has a startup, and Philadelphia, uh, and others. But you know we have such a amazing ability. You know, and I'm going to do one more thing before I introduce him because I do have a minute uh, according to the clock. If you're in the room and you've used plant-based nutrition to help you move towards reversing a disease, maybe losing a medicine, blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, if you're comfortable, stand on up for those that don't know. So I, I want you to look around. This, this is not what you're going to see at a medical conference for the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association. It's hard work, and it takes change, and it takes support and community but it happens. I'll just ask one more thing. If you're in the room and your main goal was weight loss and you've used plant-based nutrition, I'll say conservative, you lose 30 or more pounds. There's nothing special about the number. I'm just picking. Stand up if that's been a result you've been able to achieve using plant-based nutrition. Yeah. You know, and that's not, we're not shaming. We're just recognizing in the medical world Carrying excess weight can be related to certain medical conditions and medical costs, and for some people, losing weight is the pathway towards their health, and we're going to hear all about it. I have read Dr. Greger's book, the new one. He was very kind and sent me a preprint. I literally, and I'm not joking, couldn't put it down. I took notes all through it. I just haven't got to the 4,400 medical references yet at all. But, all right, well, thank you for sharing that. We do have some, you know, world record setters in the room who have completely reversed chronic conditions have completely reversed obesity. I won't point them out particularly, but you know, that's the real deal here. If you wonder if it works, you know, there are some doctors, there are some dietitians, there are some others. It's just regular people that actually watched Forks Over Knives, read some books, took a cooking class, and you know, just applied it, whatever their own medical team said or not, although you always want to work with them if you can. Dr. Michael Greger, MD, fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, <coughs> is a physician. New York Times best-selling author, and if not already, soon to be, I'm sure, a repeat New York Times best-selling author. Are you yet? Already? All right. <laughs> and an internationally recognized speaker on nutrition, food safety, and public health issues, a founding member and fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. He's a licensed general practitioner specializing in nutrition, graduating from the Cornell University School of Agriculture and Tufts University School of Medicine. He was honored with the Lifestyle Medicine Trailblazer Award in 2017 and the co-founder, of course, if you don't know, of NutritionFacts.org. The best thing you can do when you drive, when you are on vacation, just listen to him. Don't watch him while you drive, but just use your time wisely. Before the current book and the topic, his mega best-selling How Not to Die book reached unbelievable records followed by the cookbook. And I say this, this is, I think, the most amazing comment of this introdu introduction. 100% of all proceeds he's ever received from books, DVDs, speaking engagements, 
have and always will be donated to charity. And I heard on an interview... I heard on an interview that this book that he has tonight had an advance of $1.5 million. I mean, very few authors anywhere of any kind of book get that kind of money, and that all went through research. This evening, Dr. Eagle will share his research and experience on the question, how can we best use science to manage our weight most optimally? Dr. Michael Greger, come on up. Stand on up. Now the pressure's on. Mm -hmm. uh, 4,400, how about 4,990 <coughs> references? <laughs> outrageous. Exactly, outrageous. <coughs> Surely, if there was some safe, simple, side effect, free solution for the obesity epidemic, uh, we know about it by now, right? Well, I'm not so sure. Let me take an average of 17 years before research evidence makes it into day-to-day -day clinical practice. To take one example that was particularly poignant for my family, heart disease. Decades ago, Dr. Dean Ornish and colleagues published evidence in one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world that our leading cause of death could be reversed with diet and lifestyle changes alone, yet hardly anything changed. Mm -hmm. Even now, hundreds of thousands of Americans continue to die from what we learned decades ago was a reversible condition. I had seen it with my own eyes. My grandmother was cured of her end-stage heart disease by one of Dean's contemporaries, Nathan Pritikin, using similar methods. She was given a medical death sentence at age 65 after one too many open-heart surgeries, but thanks to a healthy diet, she was able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet until age 96 and continue to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. So if effectively the cure to our number one killer could get lost down some rabbit hole and ignored, what else might there be in the medical literature that could help my patients but just didn't have any corporate budget driving this promotion? Well, I made it my life's mission to find out. For, um, that's why I became a doctor in the first place and why I started my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free, no ads. No corporate sponsors are strictly non-commercial, not selling anything. It's put up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute uh, to my grandmother. New videos and articles almost every day on the latest in evidence-based nutrition. What a concept. All right. So what does the science show is the best way to lose weight? Well, if you want testimonials, and before and after pictures, you have come to the wrong place. I'm not interested in anecdotes. I'm interested in evidence. When it comes to making decisions as life and death important as what to feed yourself and your family, well, then there's really only one question. What does the best available balance of evidence say right now? The problem is that even just sticking to the peer-reviewed medical literature is not enough, as false and unscientifically unsupported beliefs about obesity are pervasive even in scientific journals. The only way to get the truth, then, is to dive deep into the primary literature, read all the original studies themselves, but who's got time for that? There are more than a half million scientific papers on obesity with a hundred new ones published every day. But that's what we do at nutritionfacts.org. We comb through tens of thousands of studies a year so you don't have to. Very nice. And indeed, 
We uncovered a treasure trove of varied data. Uh, like, uh, for example, today I'll cover simple spices proven in randomized control trials to accelerate weight loss for pennies a day, but with so little profit potential, it's no wonder that those studies never saw the light of day. It's the only profiting I care about, though, is your health. That's why 100% of the proceeds I receive from all my books are all done with charity. I just want to do for your family what Pritikin did for my family. But wait, isn't weight loss just about eating less and moving more? I mean, isn't a calorie a calorie? That's what the food industry wants you to think. The notion that a calorie from one source is just as fattening as a calorie from any other source is a trope broadcast by the food industry as a way to absolve itself of culpability. Coca-Cola even put out an ad emphasizing this one simple common sense fact. As the current and past chairs of Harvard's nutrition department put it, this central argument from industry is that the overconsumption of calories from carrots would be no different than the overconsumption of calories from soda. I mean, if calories are just a calorie, why does it matter what kind of food we put in our mouths? Well, let's explore that example of carrots versus Coca-Cola. Now, it's true that in a tightly controlled laboratory setting, the uh, 240 calories of carrots, 10 carrots, would have uh, the same effect on calorie balance as the 240 calories in a bottle of Coke, but those comparisons fall flat on their face out in the real world. I mean, you could shove those liquid candy calories down in less than a minute, but eating 240 calories of carrots might take you more than two and a half hours of constant chewing. It's been tested. <laughs> Not only would your jaw get sore, but 240 calories of carrots, that's five cups of carrots. I mean, you might not even be able to fit all those in. I mean, our stomach is only so big. I mean, once we fill it up, stretch receptors in our stomach tell us that when we've had enough, but different foods have different amounts of calories per stomach. Some foods have more calories per cup. Per, per mouthful, per pound, than others. This is the concept of calorie density, the number of calories in a given amount of food. As you can see, oil, for example, has a high calorie density, meaning it has a high calorie concentration, lots of calories in just a small space. So, drizzling just a you know, tablespoon of oil onto a dish adds over 100 calories, and for, for those same calories, you could have instead eaten about two cups of blackberries, for example, a food with low calorie density. So these two meals have the same number of calories. I mean, you could swing down a spoonful of oil and not even feel a difference in your stomach. Or maybe in a couple cups of berries, I mean, that could start to fill you up. So that's why yes, biochemically a calorie is a calorie, but eating the same amount of calories in different forms can have different effects. I mean, the average human stomach can expand to fit about four cups of food. So, you know, a single stomach full of strawberry ice cream, for example, could max out your calorie intake for the entire day. To get those same 2,000 calories from strawberries themselves, you'd have to eat 44 cups of berries. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, that's, that's 11 stomachfuls, right? I mean, as delicious as berries are, I don't think I can fill my stomach to bursting 11 times a day, right? I mean, some foods are just impossible to overeat. You physically just could not fit them into your stomach because they're so low in calorie density. I mean, you couldn't even maintain your weight. In a lab, a calorie is a calorie. But in life, far from it. Traditional weight loss diets focus on decreasing portion size, but these kind of eat less approaches can leave people feeling hungry or unsatisfied. 
A more effective approach, then, is to shift the emphasis from restriction to positive, even more messaging of increasing the intake of healthy, low-calorie, dense foods. Uh, but you don't know until you put it, put it to the test. Indeed, researchers in Hawaii tried putting people on a more traditional Hawaiian diet with all the plant foods they could eat, unlimited quantities of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans, and the study subjects lost an average of 17 pounds within 21 days. Uh, calorie intake dropped 40%, but not because they were eating less food. They lost 17 pounds in three weeks, eating more food in excess of four pounds of food a day. How could this be? Because whole plant foods tend to be so calorically dilute, you can stuff yourself without getting the same kind of weight gain. They lost 17 pounds in three weeks eating more food. That's why in my new book, How Not to Diet, which I am very excited about. Mm -hmm. That's why low in calorie density is on my list of the 17 ingredients for an ideal weight loss diet. Since Americans average about three pounds of food a day, if you stuck with mostly these foods, you could see how you could eat more food and still lose weight. Vegetables have the lowest calorie density, so researchers at Penn State uh, decided to put them to the test. Study subjects were served pasta. All they eat is as much or as little pasta as they wanted. On average, they consumed about 900 <coughs> calories of pasta. Now, what do you think would happen if, as a first course, you gave them about 100 calories of salad, composed of larger lettuce, carrots, cucumbers, celery, and cherry tomatoes? Okay. Would they go on to eat the same amount of pasta and end up with a 1,000 calorie loss? 900 plus 100? Or would they eat 100 fewer calories of pasta, effectively canceling out the added salad calories? It was even better than that. They ate more than 200 fewer calories. Thanks to the salad, 100 calories in, 200 calories out. So in essence, the salad had negative 100 calories. Preloading with vegetables can effectively subtract 100 calories out of a meal. That's how you can lose weight by eating more food. Of course, the type of salad matters. The researchers repeated the experiment, adding a fatty dressing and shredded cheese, mm -hmm. um, which quadrupled the salad's calorie density. Now, eating that salad as a first course didn't turn a 900-calorie meal into one with less than 800 calories. Instead, it turned it into a meal with, uh, you know, calories in a quadruple digit. I mean, it's like a preloading pizza with garlic bread or something, right? I mean, just, you end up eating more food, um, more calories overall. So, what's the cutoff? Studies on preloading show that eating about a cup of food before a meal decreases subsequent intake by about 100 calories. So to get a negative calorie effect, the first course would have to contain less than 100 calories per cup. So as you can see in the chart, that includes most fresh fruits and vegetables, but having something like a dinner roll or something would just simply not work. But hey, give people a large apple to eat before that same pasta meal, and rather than consuming about 200 calories less, it was more like 300 calories <coughs> less. So, how many calories does an apple have? It depends on when you eat it. Mm. Even before a meal, you can effectively have negative 200 calories. You see the same thing giving people vegetable soup as a first course. Hundreds of calories disappear. One study that uh, tracked people's intake throughout the entire day even found that overweight subjects randomized to pre-lunch vegetable soup not only ate less lunch, 
but deducted an extra bonus 100 calories from dinner too, a whole seven hours later. So, the next time you sit down with some healthy soup, you can imagine calories being veritably sucked out of your system with every spoonful. Even just drinking two cups of water immediately before a meal costs people to eat about 10 less, taking in about 100 to a cup. So, no wonder why overweight men and women randomized to two cups of water before each meal lost weight 44% faster. Two cups of water before each meal, 44% faster weight loss. Well, who's going to profit from telling you that? That's why so-called negative calorie preloading is on my list of weight loss boosters. These are um, all the things uh, I could find that can accelerate weight loss regardless of what you eat the rest of the time. Anything we can put on that first course salad to boost weight loss even further? Well, in my Amping AMPK section, I talk about ways to activate an enzyme known as the fat controller. Its discovery is considered one of the most important medical breakthroughs in the last few decades. You can activate it, this enzyme, through exercise, fasting, or nicotine. But is there any way to boost it for weight loss without the sweat, hunger, or whole dying a horrific death of lung cancer thing? Yeah. Well, big pharma is all over it. I mean, after all, <laughs> obese individuals may be unwilling to perform even a minimum of physical activity or to perform pharmacologists, thus indicating that drugs mimicking endurance exercise may be highly desirable. So, it's crucial that oral compounds with high bioavailability are developed to safely induce chronic AMP activation for long-term weight loss and maintenance. But there's no need to develop such a compound because you can already buy it at any grocery store. It's called vinegar. When vinegar, acetic acid, is metabolized by our body, you get a natural NMPK boost. I mean, enough of a boost, though, to, to lose weight at a typical dose you might get dressing a cell. Well, let's look. I mean, look. Vinegar has been evidently used for centuries for weight loss, but only recently has it been put to the test. A random, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial on the effects of vinegar intake on the reduction of body fat in overweight men and women. Subjects were randomized to drink a beverage containing one to two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar or a placebo-controlled group drinking a beverage developed to taste like the vinegar drink but compared with a different kind of acid, so it didn't actually have any vinegar in it. Three months in, the fake vinegar placebo group actually gained body fat, as overweight people tend to do over time, whereas the genuine vinegar group significantly lost body fat, as determined by CT scan. A little vinegar a day led to pounds of weight loss achieved for just pennies a day without removing any that's my, why one of my 21 tweaks to accelerate weight loss is two teaspoons of vinegar with each meal, either sprinkled on the salad or even just, uh, you know, added to a you know, with some lemon juice or something. Now, the vinegar studies were nice because they were placebo-controlled, I and mean, that's hard to do with food, right? People tend to know what they're eating. Um, uh, I mean, you can't stuff a cabbage into a capsule, but there are some foods so potent that you can actually fit them into a pill to pit them against placebos, and that's spices. Want to know if garlic can cause weight loss? Well, simple. Give people some garlic powder pills right, versus placebo pills, and garlic worked resulting in both a drop of weight and waistlines within six weeks. Now here they used half a teaspoon of garlic powder a day. That would cost less than four cents. Uh, four cents too steep? Well, how about two cents? A quarter teaspoon of garlic powder a day. About 100 men and women were randomized to a quarter teaspoon of garlic powder a day. And those unknowingly taking the two 
cents worth of garlic bread. Lost about six pounds of straight body fat over the next 15 years. Now if you can splurge up to three cents a day for all the big spenders, there's black human meta-analysis of randomized control trials show weight loss efficacy with again just a quarter teaspoon a day. So wait a second, what is black human? You obviously have not been reading your Bible. Described as a miracle herb. Besides the weight loss, there are randomized control trials showing daily black human consumption significantly improving cholesterol and triglycerides, significantly improving blood pressure and blood sugar control. But I use it just because it tastes good. Right? It's just a spice. I just put black cumin seeds in a pepper grinder and just use it like black pepper. With more than a thousand papers published in the medical literature on black cumin, some reporting extraordinary results, like dropping cholesterol levels as much as a statin drug. Why don't we hear more about it? I mean, why weren't we taught about it in medical school? Presumably because there's no profit motive. Black cumin is just a common natural spice. I mean, you're not going to thrill your stockholders selling something you can't patent that costs only three cents a day. Or you can use regular cumin, uh, acts as an appetite suppressant. Those randomized to a half teaspoon for lunch and dinner over three months, plus four more pounds and an extra inch off their waist, uh, found comparable to an obesity drug known as Orlistat. Uh, that may sound familiar. That's the anal leakage drug you may have heard about. <laughs> Though the drug company evidently prefers the term fecal spotting to describe <laughs> the rectal discharge that their drug causes, the drug company's website offers some helpful tips, though. It's probably a smart idea to wear dark pants <laughs> and bring a change of clothes with you to work. I mean, you know, just in case their drug causes you to crap your pants at work. placebo controlled trials to work with. Probably never heard about any of this because it just can't make enough profit. My section on fat burning foods, excuse me, fat blocking foods, starts out with a command to eat your thylakoid doctor's orders. What on earth is a thylakoid? Oh, just the source of all-known life and uh, the oxygen we breathe, no biggie. Thylakoids are where photosynthesis takes place. The process by which plants turn light into food. Thylakoids are these, the great green engine of life. These uh, microscopic little sac-like structures composed of chlorophyll-rich membranes concentrated in the leaves of plants. When we eat thylakoids, in other words, when you bite into a leaf of spinach, those green leaf membranes don't get immediately digested. They can last for hours in our, in our intestines, and that's where they work their magic. Thylakoid membranes bind to lipase. Lipase is the enzyme our body uses to digest fat. So if you bind the enzyme, then you can slow fat absorption. You say, wait a second. I mean, if all fat is eventually absorbed, though, what's the benefit? Location, location, location. There's a phenomenon known as the illegal break. 
the, the alien is the last part of the small intestine before it dumps into the large intestine. When undigested calories are discovered, detected that far down in your intestine, your body thinks, oh, I must be full from stem to stern, and <coughs> puts the brakes on eating more by dialing down your appetite. This can be shown in experiment. If you insert a nine-foot tube down people's throats and then drip in any kind of calories, fat, protein, sugar, you can activate the illegal brain. Then sit them down to an all-you-can-eat meal, and compared to the placebo group that just got a little squirt of water through the tube, they eat over 100 calories less. They just don't feel as hungry. Right? They feel just as full eating significantly less. That the illegal brain in action. This can then translate the weight loss. Randomize overweight women to a diet of green plant membranes. In other words, just covertly slip them a little powdered spinach, and they get a boost in appetite suppressing hormone. A decreased urge for sweets, um, and a decreased urge for chocolate. This is amazing. So these are um, women who've been uh, who've been Slips in spinach versus something that just looked like green powder, but that wasn't actually spinach. So they didn't know who was who. But look at this this craving for sweets. This is hours later, four hours later. Um, those that got the spinach, they're like sweets, sweet chocolate. Who wants chocolate? I don't even like it, right? Hmm. Versus, I mean, just amazing difference, you know? Just because they got slipped a little of these thylakoids. It just it changed the whole brain chemistry over it. Um, uh, so uh, now the uh, and oh and of course the most important part is the accelerated weight loss. Boom, right? All thanks to eating green, the actual green itself, the chlorophyll packed membranes in the leaves. Now, researchers use spinach powder only because then they can disguise it so they couldn't tell who was actually eating spinach or not. But you can get just as many thylakoids eating a half cup of cooked spinach a day. Right? Totally doable. Uh, which is, look, that's what I recommend people eat two times a day in my daily dozen checklist of all the healthiest of healthy foods. I encourage people to fit into their daily routine. In the journal of the Society of Chemical Industry, a group of food technologists argued that given their fat blocking benefits, thylakoid membranes could be incorporated into functional foods as a promising new appetite reducing ingredient. Or you could just get them the way Mother Nature intended. And now, though thylakoids eventually get uh, broken down fiber, it makes it all the way down to our colon. And while it's technically true that we can't digest fiber, it's only applicable to the part of us that's actually human. Most of the cells in our body are actually bacteria. Our, our gut flora, um, which weighs as much as one of our kidneys, metabolically active as our liver, has been called our forgotten organ. And it's an organ that runs on MAC, microbiota accessible uh, carbohydrates. Um, so when you see me you know, write things like, uh, uh, you know, eat lots of Big Macs, I don't want anyone to get any wrong impression here. Uh, MAC is just another name for prebiotics, what our good flora eat. In other words, fiber. Uh, what do our good bugs do with fiber? Well, we feed them and they feed us right back. They make short chain fatty acids with fiber. Then they get absorbed from our core into our bloodstream, circulate throughout our body, and even end up in our, in our brain. It's like the way our gut flora communicate with us by sending out these little chemical signals, dialing down our appetite, all the while increasing the rate at which we burn fat and boosting our metabolism at the same time, all thanks to fiber. Check this out. Put people in a brain scanner and show them a high-calorie food like a donut and the reward centers in the brains instantly light up. But if you repeat the experiment, but this time, 
secretly deliver fiber-derived short-chain fatty acids directly into their rectum, <laughs> you get a blunted reward center response, and subjects report that high-calorie foods just seem less appealing. And subsequently, they ate less of an all-you-can-eat meal. But fiber supplements like uh, Metamucil don't work. Which makes sense because they're non-fermentable, meaning your good gut bugs can't eat it. So yeah, it improves bowel regularity, uh, but can't be used by a good gut bacteria to make those compounds that block your craving. And for that, you actually have to eat real food. Our good gut bugs are trying to help us. Right? But when we eat a diet deficient in fiber, we are in effect starving our microbial cell. Less than 5% of Americans even reached the recommended minimum adequate intake of fiber. No surprise, since the number one source of fiber are beans and whole grains, and 96% of Americans don't even reach the recommended minimum intake of legumes, the beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils. And 99% even reach the recommended minimum for whole grain. Most people don't even know what fiber is. More than half of Americans surveyed think that steak is a significant source of fiber. However, by definition, fiber is only found in one place, and that's plants. And zero fiber, you need dairy or eggs, and little or no fiber in processed junk, and therein lies our problem. Okay, but yeah, but wouldn't at least the protein in that steak fill you up? Well, surprisingly, even a review supported by the meat, dairy, and egg industries acknowledged that protein intake does not actually translate into eating less later on. Whereas uh, you eat a fiber-rich whole grain for supper, and it can cut your calorie intake more than 12 hours later at lunch the next day. You feel full about 100 calories quicker the following day because by then your good gut bugs are chewing down on the same food and dialing down your appetite. Today, even meat could be considered junk food more than a century. One of the major goals of animal agriculture was to increase the carcass fat quantity. Let me take chicken, for example. You know, 100 years ago, the USDA determined chicken was about 23% protein by weight and less than 2% fat. Today, chickens have been man genetically manipulated through selective breeding to have 10 times more fat. Chicken little has become chicken big and maybe making us bigger too. Now, uh, meat consumption in general is associated with weight gain but poultry appears to be the worst. Even just a, a, an ounce a day, I mean, that's like a single chicken nugget, or one chicken breast every 10 days, is associated with weight gain compared to eating no chicken at all. Uh, you know, it's funny, when the, when the meat industry funds obesity studies on chicken, they choose for their head-to-head -head comparison foods like cookies and sugar-coated chocolates. <laughs> now, this is a classic drug industry trick where you make your product look better by comparing it to something substandard, right? But apparently just regular chocolate wasn't enough to <laughs> make chicken look better. <laughs> okay, but what happens when chicken is pitted against a real control, like chicken without the actual chicken? Chicken, chickens out. Both soy-based proteins and corn, which is a plant-based meat made from the mushroom kingdom, have found out stronger satiating qualities than chicken. Uh, I feed people a chicken and rice lunch, and four and a half hours later, they eat 80% more calories at a dinner buffet than those who had instead been given a lunch of chicken-free chicken and rice. These findings are consistent with childhood obesity research, they found that meat consumption seemed to double the odds of school children becoming overweight compared to the consumption of plant-based meat products. Now, of course, whole food sources of plant protein like beans did even better, though, associated with cutting in half 
the odds of kids becoming overweight. So that's why I consider these kinds of you know plant-based meats as a more of a useful stepping stone towards a healthier diet rather than the end game idea. And part of the reason that plant-based meats may be less fattening is that they cause less of an insulin spike. Uh, a meat-free chicken like corn causes up to 41% less of an immediate insulin reaction. It turns out animal protein causes almost exactly as much insulin release as pure sugar. sugar. Just adding some egg whites to your diet can increase insulin up by as much as 60% within four days, and fish, maybe even more. Wait a second, why would adding tuna to mashed potatoes spike up insulin number, uh, but adding broccoli instead cut the insulin response by about 40%? I mean, it's not the fiber, because given the exact same amount of broccoli fiber alone, uh, provided no significant benefit. So why does the animal protein make things worse, but the plant protein make things better? Well, plant proteins tend to be lower in branched chain amino acids, uh, which are associated with insulin resistance, the cause of type 2 diabetes. Uh, you can show this experimentally. You give some vegans branched chain amino acids, and you can make them as insulin resistant as omnivores. Or you take some omnivores and you put them even through a 48-hour vegan diet challenge. And within two days, you can see the opposite. Significant improvement in metabolic health. Why? Because decreased consumption of branched chain amino acids improves metabolic health. Check this out. Those randomized to restrict their protein intake um, were averaging literally hundreds more calories per day. So they should become fatter, right? But no. They actually lost more body fat. Restricting mm. their protein enabled them to eat more calories, while at the same time they lost more weight, more calories, but a loss of body fat. And this magic protein restriction, they were just having people eat the recommended amount of protein. Right? So maybe they should have called this the you know normal protein group or the recommended protein group. And the group that is eating more typical American protein levels and suffering the loss of it, uh, the excess protein group. Given the metabolic harms of excess branched chain amino acid exposure, leaders in the field have suggested the invention of drugs to block their absorption, mm -hmm. to promote metabolic health and treat diabetes and obesity without restricting caloric intake. Or we can just try to not eat so many branched chain amino acids in the first place. Where are they found? Mostly in meat. meat. Including chicken and fish, dairy products, and eggs. Uh, perhaps explain why animal protein has been associated with higher risk of diabetes, whereas plant protein appears protective. So defining the appropriate upper limits of animal protein intake may offer a great chance for the prevention of type 2 diabetes and obesity but it need not be all or nothing. Even an intermittent vegan diet may be benefit. If there is one piece of advice that best sums up the recommendations in my new book, it would be to wall off your cows. Let me tell you what, that, what I mean by that. Animal cells are encased only in easily digestible membranes, which are allowed the enzymes in our gut to, to effortlessly liberate the calories given a you know, steak, for example. But plant cells, on the other hand, have cell walls that are made out of fiber, which acts as an indigestible physical barrier, so many of the calories remain trapped. Now, processed plant foods like fruit juice, right, sugar, refined grains, even the whole grains, if they've been powdered into flour, have had their cellular structure destroyed. Their cell wall is cracked open, and their calories are free for the taking. But when we eat structurally intact plant food, chew all you want, you're still going to end up with calories completely encapsulated by fiber, which then blunts the glycemic index activates the ileal break and provides sustenance to our friendly flora. So, bottom line, try to make sure 
as many good calories as possible. Your protein, your carbs, your fat are encased in cell walls. In other words, from whole intact plant food. That's what nature intended to happen I mean, millions of years before we learned how to sharpen spears and, and, and mill grains and boil sugar cane. Our entire physiology is presumed to involved in the context of eating what the rest of our great egg cousins eat, plants. The Paleolithic period, when we started using tools, well, it goes back about two million years. We know the great apes have been evolving since back in the Miocene era, more like you know, 20 million years ago. So for the first 90% of our hominoid existence, our bodies evolved on mostly plants. So it's no wonder our bodies may thrive best on the diets we were designed to eat, so maybe we should go back to our roots. <coughs> With enough portion control, anyone can lose weight. You lock someone in the closet, you can force them to lose as much body fat as you want. Chaining someone to a treadmill could have a similar effect. Okay, but what is the most effective weight loss regimen that doesn't involve calorie restriction or exercise or felony? Well, <laughs> I have scoured the medical literature at all, and looked at all the randomized control trials and the single most successful strategy to date is a diet of whole plant food. The single most effective weight loss intervention like that ever published in the Peruvian scientific literature, a whole food plant-based diet. And that works better than anything else studied to date. And no wonder, right, given what we just learned about fiber, right, and amino acids and all that stuff. Okay. I mean, look, we've known for more than 40 years that those eating predominantly plant-based weigh on average about 30 pounds less than the uh, general population. But you don't know if it's the diet itself until you put it to the test. In 2017, a group of New Zealand researchers published a broad study, a 12-week randomized control trial done in the poorest region of the country with the highest obesity rates. Overweight individuals were randomized to receive either standard uh, medical care or semi-weekly classes offering advice and encouragement through the low-fat diet centered around fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And that's all it was. Just empowerment with knowledge. No meals were provided. Or the intervention groups were just merely informed about the benefits of plant-based eating and encouraged to you know, try to fit it into their own lives. Well, no significant change in the control group, as expected, but the plant-based group, even without any restrictions on portions, and able to you know, freely eat all the healthy plant foods they wanted, lost an average of 19 pounds oh, by the end of the three-month study. Okay. I mean, 19 pounds, that's a, that's a respectable weight loss. Okay, yeah, but what happened next? Right? At the end of those 12 weeks, class was dismissed and no more instruction was given. Uh, but the researchers were curious, though, as to you know, how much weight the subjects had gained back after being released from the study. So everyone was invited back at the six-month mark to get reweighed. I mean, yeah, the plant-based group had left the three-month study 19 pounds lighter, but, you know, after six months, they were only down 27 pounds. They got even better, right? See, the plant-based group had been feeling so good, both physically and mentally, had been able to come off so many of their medications that they were sticking with the diet on their own, and the weight had continued to come up. What about a year later? You know, even in studies that last a whole year, right, where people are coached to stay on a particular diet the entire time, by the end of the year, any initial weight lost at the beginning of the first few months, you know, tends to creep on back, right? The breath that only lasted three months Yet after it was all over, those who'd been randomized to the plant-based group not only lost dozens of pounds, they kept it off. Not only did they achieve greater weight loss in six and twelve months than any other comparable trial, it was months after the study had already ended. A whole food plant-based diet achieved the greatest weight loss ever recorded compared to any other such intervention published in the medical world. You can read the record-breaking study in full for free at nature.com slash article slash nutb2173 or you can just point your phone camera at the screen and pick off the QR code. 
Now, any diet that results in reduced calorie intake can result in weight loss. I mean, shedding pounds isn't so much the issue. The problem is keeping them off. And a key difference between plant-based nutrition and more traditional approaches to weight loss is that people are encouraged to eat ad libitum, meaning eat as much as you want. No calorie counting or portion control, just eating, right? The strategy is to improve the quality of food rather than restricting the quantity of food. You put people on a diet packed with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans, and allow them to eat as much as they want, they end up eating about 50% fewer calories than they would have otherwise. Uh, just as full on half the calories? At least, how can you keep people satisfied cutting more than 1,000 calories out of their daily diets? You do that by feeding them high bulk, low calorie density foods, vegetables, fruit, whole grains, and beans, and fewer calorie dense foods like the meat, cheese, and sugars, and fats. Now, but it may not all just be on the calories in that side of the equation. Those who are more plant-based would tend to be effectively burning more calories in their sleep. The resting metabolic rate of those even more plant-based, maybe 10% higher or more. A boost of metabolism that can translate into burning off hundreds of extra calories a day, uh, more, without doing a thing. Eating more plant-based, you burn more calories just being alive, just, just existing. So no wonder why those eating more plant-based tend to be slimmer. Start packing your diet with uh, real food that grows out of the ground, and the pounds should come off naturally, taking down toward your ideal weight. But what about ketogenic diet? Body fat actually slows, body fat loss actually slows down after you switch to a ketogenic diet because your body starts cannibalizing its own protein. And just looking at the bathroom scale, though, the keto diet seems like a smashing success. Losing less than a pound a week on a regular diet, and then boom, three and a half pounds within seven days after switching to keto. But what was happening inside their bodies? Told a totally different story. On a ketogenic diet, their rate of body fat loss was slowed by more than half. So what they were losing was water, but they were also losing protein, also losing lean mass. This may help explain why CrossFit trainees placed on ketogenic diets, um, though their leg muscles can shrink as much as 8% within two months. Of course, even if keto diet works, the goal of weight loss is not to fit into a skinnier casket. <laughs> People whose diets even tend to trend that way appear to live significantly shorter lives. On the other hand, even just drifting in the direction of even more healthy plant food is associated with living longer. Now, those going the other way, though, those who start out more plant-based, but then add meat back into their diets at least once a week, not only appear to double or triple their odds of diabetes, stroke, heart attack, and weight gain, but may also suffer an associated 3.6-year drop in life expectancy. That's going from no meat to just once-a-week meat or more. Low-carb diets have been shown to impair artery function and worsen heart disease, whereas whole food plant-based diets have been shown to actually reverse heart disease, right? That's what Ornish used. So it appears to be the most effective diet for weight loss. It just so happens to be the only diet ever proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients. My grandma didn't have to die like that. Maybe no one's grandma has to die like that. If that's all a plant-based diet can do, reverse the number one killer of men and women, is that going kind to of be the default diet to improve another one? And the fact that it can also be so effective in preventing, arresting, and reversing other leading killers like type 2 diabetes and, and high blood pressure would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. Only one diet has been shown to do all that, a diet centered around whole plant foods. So we don't have to mortgage our health 
to lose weight. The single healthiest diet also proves to be the most effective diet for weight loss. After all, permanent weight loss requires permanent dietary change. And healthier habits just have to become a way of life. And if they're going to be lifelong, you want them to lead to a long life. Thankfully, the single best diet proven for weight loss just so happens to be the safest, cheapest way to eat for the longest, healthiest life. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so much. So Greg, are we going to take some more questions? Let's do it. All right. So we'll have a mic on both sides. Does balsamic vinegar work in well with apple cider? It absolutely does yes. because it's just the acetic acid. In fact, even that nasty white distilled vinegar works. Mm -hmm. Although I, I would prefer people use something like apple cider or balsamic, because then you actually have a few grape phytonutrients, a few apple phytonutrients in there. But, it's that, but the active ingredient is actually the acetic acid, which makes vinegar vinegar. So by definition, vinegar works two teaspoons of that vinegar. But never, um, you, you can't just take it straight. You burn yourself in this. So I'm never, you got to put it in something. nutritionist and I am anti-keto, but how do you explain to people that are having results where the blood sugars are going down and cholesterol numbers are going down? Do you, yeah, yeah. So because so the number one source of calories in the American diet is a fine carb. In fact, in terms of food wise, it's grain-based desserts. So pastries, cake, cookies, etc. That's the number one source of calories in the American diet. So you cut out the number one source of calories then through caloric restriction, people can lose weight. Um, and the, the ketosis, uh, being in ketosis, I've got videos about this, um, also blunts your appetite. So people are able to maintain that caloric um, restriction long term they lose weight. You lose weight by any means, and your cholesterol goes down. You lose weight by, by you know, getting AIDS and tuberculosis or a good meth habit or you know, chemotherapy, anything, your mm. cholesterol will plummet. Um, and of course, in terms of blood sugars, they're not eating any carbohydrate. And now, of course, they're becoming more insulin resistant every day because they're packing their muscles with all, the, with all this fat that's causing insulin resistance. But who, can, I mean, who would know it because they're not eating any carbohydrates, so their blood sugars are really low. But of course, their diabetes isn't any better. In fact, it's actually worse, um, or their prediabetes are insulin resistant because as soon as they start eating any kind of, you know, they eat a banana or something, all of a sudden their blood sugar skyrockets higher than it would have otherwise. Um, so, and thank God it's uh, unsustainable, because if it isn't, then they're going to run into these horrible ones and health problems like the acceleration of heart disease. Okay. Um, I do you recommend a probiotic, or should this be easy? So your gut flora are in there um, when you're born, thanks to your mom's birth canal, um, and will stay with you your whole life unless you take some oral antibiotics, certain broad spectrum oral antibiotics like Marxism, to wipe out your gut flora such that it takes two months for it to get back. And so if you suffer from antibiotic-associated um, diarrhea, so you take antibiotics, and then all of a sudden you get diarrhea, chronic diarrhea, lasts more than two weeks, then taking a probiotic supplement, like a mixed acid alpha product, is a good idea. It's a treatment. Um, of course, you want to make sure it's alive. And so, um, you know, just because it's in the refrigerator section of the National Food Store doesn't mean it wasn't sitting on a hot truck for two weeks or whatever. So what you do is you take it home, you open up two capsules, and you, dip, and you, you, uh, you know, you, 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 you dump it into like a two bowl, one of two bowls of uh, milk, soy milk, any kind of milk, um, and then you come back in the morning, 
Um, and they should look totally different. One should be filmy and gross and foamy and yogurty. The other one should be fine. But if you pour them both down the same, they both look the same. Well, you have a dead product. It's not going to help you at all. You're taking back your money back. But in terms of day to day, if you're not, um, not as, an, as a treatment of antibiotic assisted diarrhea, but well, I just want to have good, good gut bugs in my stomach, well, you do that by you feeding the good gut bugs you already have, right? Um, there's a, I have a video where I do an analogy. It's like, let's say you have a shed full of bunny rabbits, and you want to make more bunny rabbits. Um, and, and you're feeding your bunny rabbits pork rinds. Okay, you're feeding your bunny, and then they're all dying off. And you're like, no big deal, I'll go to the store and get more bunnies, and you just repopulate. That's taking probiotics. You're starving your gut bugs, Right? They're dying because you're not feeding what they're meant to eat. Well, fine, so you're taking more, right? Or there's another way you can make more bunnies. You feed them carrots, feed what they're meant to eat, and they are full, full, multiply all by themselves. Right? Um, and so that's what, and so you've got a few good ones in there, but they're, you know, but the, but, you know, if you're a standard American diet, all the cheeseburger and milkshake eating bugs, or they're the, they're the big, and, you know, are, are shouldering out, you're crowding out your poor little fiber eaters. They're like, please, eat some garnish, something, please. Um, but then all of a sudden, you start adding beans to your diet, starting over, and all of a sudden, the good gut bugs are, oh yeah, bring it. You know, and then they, you know, and then the fiber feeders start taking over, and the bad bugs start dying off, and slowly but surely, you'll populate your gut. And, Keep it going. So that's, and there's actually prebiotics, there's actually probiotics, there's good gut bugs, actually on uh, raw fruits and vegetables. I don't know anybody knows how to make sauerkraut. I mean, when I, when I, I, when I uh, was thinking, oh, uh, you must make sauerkraut kind of like you make yogurt, right? You take, you know, lettuce and you add some kind of starter, fermentation bugs or something. No. You take cabbage and you put it in salt water so other bad bugs don't grow. And all of a sudden, it turns into it ferments into uh, it ferments into sauerkraut. How did that happen? Where did these lactic acid uh, producing bugs, these lactobacillus, come from? They were on the spinach leaves as soon as they, the cabbage leaves out in the field, naturally growing. So we can get the best of both worlds: probiotics and prebiotics by eating whole, healthy plants. And sauerkraut isn't good because you get too much salt. Right? Just that was just a little okay. Yeah. Um, I just got a quick question about, like, uh, in terms of nutrition, um, would you say smoothies would be better or, like, a whole food? Like, I know in your videos you mentioned, you know, we can't really, we can't really trip the food that well as, like, we'll get in a blender and we'll be readily more absorbed nutrition in a smoothie, but I know more research is coming out on phallopoids. Could you just explain the differences between like a smoothie and even like a, a whole whole food? Yeah, so I so I mean smoothies are whole foods, right? They're just whole foods put in a blender. So what would not be a whole food is juice, fruit and vegetable juicing, right? Um, well, because then you throw away the fiber. Um, but you retain the fiber and all the fiber and everything when you um, blend in a smoothie. The problem with smoothies. Um, from a weight loss standpoint, is rate of consumption. Um, uh, we can, you can drink a uh, smoothie so quickly, slow it down so quickly, that we get such a rush of, uh, of these, these are digestible carbohydrates, that we actually get excel, uh, the exaggerated blood sugar spike. So, but all you have to do is drink the smoothie at the rate it would take you to eat that many fruits and vegetables. Are you making a big green smoothie, like you pack, uh, a blender full of fruits and vegetables, right? Think how long it will take you to eat. Like, oh my God, I'm sitting there eating. Okay, well that's how long you got to sit, sit your smoothie for. Make them thick, use a thin straw, and really, you know, sip it in time. And then, you know, and look, you work, you know, or whatever, and so you can sip it throughout the day, then you get the benefits of both But, um, yeah, so, but the, the, the negative metabolic effects of smoothies um, it's all because of the, the, the rate um, at which you're eating um, in terms of calorie, kind of calories per minute. But if you take that same smoothie and just drip it out um, over the time you naturally eat those fruits and vegetables, so your body can handle it, then there's no negative metabolic <coughs> effects. Okay. Uh, what do you recommend to someone who has lupus in the form of health issues? Who has what? Who has lupus. Oh, lupus. Right. And what are your thoughts on soy? Ah, 
I've got some lupus videos coming up. So the only lupus video, so anyone familiar, lupus is a, a nasty autoimmune inflammatory disease. So, you know, you've heard of, uh, you know, like autoimmune disease where your body attacks your own thyroid, you get hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Like, oh, that's terrible. Your body's attacked, or type 1 diabetes, your body attacks your own pancreas. Well, in lupus, your body attacks your own DNA, right? So it attacks your whole body. Your whole body attacks your whole body. And so it can cause all sorts of horrible things. Eventually, one of the first things your kidney shut down. I mean, so it's just a terrible disease. Okay. But it's an inflammatory disease. So maybe an anti-inflammatory diet could do it. Um, and so there was a, so the single most anti-inflammatory food in the dietary inflammatory index, anti-inflammatory index, um, is, uh, is turmeric. So there's actually a study um, showing that you could decrease, that you could improve kidney function in lupus veterans with just that one spice turmeric. Um, but um, this uh, uh, doctor by the name of Brooke Goldner, um, Brooke Goldner said, why use one anti-inflammatory food? Let's make a whole diet of, of the most anti-inflammatory food. And she, she produced this, like, made up this, like, practically, like, green smoothie diet. It was just, like, packed with greens, packed with berries, packed with every anti-inflammatory thing, gave it to lupus patients. And I've got a video coming up shortly, so make sure to subscribe, um, uh, uh, talking about her initial results. She's had results for years. Like every time I see her, I'm like, you gotta publish it. It does not exist in science unless you publish it. Uh, and she finally published it. Yay! And so I made a video. I was so excited to make a video about it. And you will see her extraordinary um, results like um, these women who is unfortunately mostly women for some reason um, get the disease, um, who were on the kidney transplant list. Um, and then all of a sudden were not because they didn't need kidneys anymore. Amazing! Because some kidneys started working. Um, all thanks to that. And then she adds on, it's not like green smoothies forever, but just in the first few weeks to get people in remission um, and to use flares. Really amazing stuff. Um, and uh, so, keep an eye out. Could you address the uh, problems associated with lectins? Oh. Uh, supposedly found in healthy vegetables. Yes. The plant paradox. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have, uh, I started getting emails about this book to, called The Plant Paradox, given by this guy, Gundry? No, Gundry, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and I was like, what? Right. But once you get enough emails about something, that's why I started getting emails when you see something. Um, and if you're the only person that ever emails me about something, I'm like, yeah. Okay, but if you're like the 10th person to email, I'm like, oh, I better look into this, right? Because, you know. Um, and so people can email them and look, and so the whole theme of this book, uh, The Plant Paradox, is that there are these lectins in food, like so-called healthy foods like beans and tomatoes, and, you know, um, and, and they're really bad for you. And so it's a paradox, because plants are supposed to be good for you, but oh, they're actually evil for you. Okay. So I did a series of videos, the first of which, I mean, I didn't really mince words, Dr. Gundry's Plant Paradox is Wrong. That's the title of the video. Um, and then I talk about lectins, I go through the whole thing. I'm um, something interesting you can, you can watch the videos, but basically it turns out that if anything, lectins are probably good for you, they're not harmful, unless you, I mean, you can't eat raw kidney beans, but how can you eat raw kidney beans anyway? Because they're little rocks, you gotta cook them, and once they're, once you can mash them with a fork, once they're edible, then they're perfectly safe, and you can wipe off all the lectins. But there have been rare case reports of people not knowing how to make beans, and so they put red kidney beans in water, soak them overnight, so they're like hard, firm, and rubbery. Um, and they didn't cook them at all, and just like made like a bean salad out of them or something. I don't know how you can eat that, but people got really sick. Really, so if you want to like play a really bad practical joke on someone, give them some rubbery kidney beans, uncooked kidney beans. They, yeah, they will not be having cancers. Violent, violent uh, uh, vomiting. Anyway, hmm. um, but but no. But as soon as they're edible, then they're, then all the lectins are gone. Um, and the lectins and foods that you don't cook, like tomatoes, are perfectly harmless. Blah blah blah. And in fact, they have anti-cancer properties. Blah blah blah. 
saw the videos, check it out. Uh, yeah. All right. Oh, over oh, there. Hi, Dr. Greger. Welcome to Michigan. Oh, thank you. Uh, all right. My question is grains and seeds and spices. No. Grains, you make me want hungry. To keep... What do you mean? <laughs> grains, you want to keep whole and not break. I get that. If you had said the black spoon, you put it in a pepper grinder to break it. Yeah. You break yeah. it. Why is that? Break it. <laughs> So, um, and just similarly with, um, like, garlic powder. I said, why garlic powder? Why buy garlic powder? I buy garlic, right? Um, the, the studies were not done with garlic. The studies were, why were they done with garlic powder? Because then you could disguise it into a pill. Because they wanted to do a placebo sugar pill versus the garlic pill, and no one knew the difference. In fact, they even took some garlic powder and sprinkled it on the outside of the sugar pill to make them smell garlic. And just so you really didn't know which one you were getting. But you couldn't do that with real garlic. Like, how do you give people grilled garlic and that so they don't know? So the studies well done with dry garlic. Um, and so I said, well, look, this is what the science shows. And now, look, maybe raw garlic works better. Maybe cooked garlic works even better than raw. Ooh, we don't know. But look, this is what the science shows, so we stick with the science. Um, and the reason is for like, well, isn't it obvious that, that like fresh garlic would work better? Not so with the ginger. That's really interesting. The ginger powder, fresh ginger doesn't work. That has actually been put to the test. So wait a second, how can fresh ginger not work? Because the actual ingredient is what they call these compounds called shojos, which are dehydration products of ginger. When ginger dries, new compounds are created. And it's the new compounds that actually work. So dried ginger works, fresh ginger doesn't work. So that was mind blowing to me. I was like, what? Right? So I was like, oh, well, I better tell people dried ginger, not that I mean dried garlic, excuse me. Because maybe dry garlic is actually different than regular garlic. So I'm going to stick to what the science is. That's what the experiment is. Hi. Um, I'm a nurse case manager, and I have a unique role in that I present this to people who didn't come to me with me before. I present them to them. What I found is, and I don't even know if you can address this, but what I found this year was the American College of Technology came out with a recommendation to primary care doctors, and the only diet I could just go off is that they recommend is a plant-based diet. The problem is none of my doctors even knew what a plant-based diet was. And then I began to wonder how many of these endocrinologists, if you asked them, knew what a plant-based diet was, because my parents and my patients would go back to their endocrinologists, come back like Sarah Joe in a headlight. So if you even know, and, you can, and I don't know what you do, but where is the American Medical Association on this? Mm. And the American Diet Test Society is still I will certainly send my patients to diabetic education because they're still not teaching players. And yeah. my kidney doctors don't get it. My people are getting right. better, and the patients buy it because they understand it, but their doctors, because I always say, go back and tell your doctor what you're doing. Yes. And all, they, yeah. all I hear is, keep doing what you're telling me to do. Keep doing what you're telling me to do, but nobody will they know. connect. Right. Yeah, they won't yeah connect no, that's unfortunate. Yeah, you know, that, you know, uh, there's actually this new, um, new people always ask me all the time where they can find a plant-based physician. Um, and so I'm excited, this is a new resource. Uh, my monthly email, my subscriber email that comes out, I don't know, it either just came out or it's coming out this week, um, talks about that there's this new organization. Oh, we actually have a, a board member here, a fellow board member. I'm part of Physician Association for Nutrition, this is a new international group, and they're putting together a free directory of all type of practitioners in the world, that's cool. Um, but, and it's great that it exists, but if we all just go to the plant-based people, we're never going to show the other people, we're not going to show the power that nutrition can have to the docs that really need to be educated. In fact, when I go to these big American College of Lifestyle Medicine conferences, with the plant-based nutrition healthcare conference now, there's thousands of plant-based docs. And I sit them down, and we all sit and eat together, because what else do you do in a plant-based conference and eat, right? Um, uh, and I said, well, how did you learn about this? I mean, because none of us got it in medical school, obviously. So where did you find about this? You know what they say? Patient. Patient talking. Some pa one of their patients, who they know for years, goes, saw forks over knives, or what the health, or read a book, a China study, whatever, 
And then they change their diet on their own, they come back to the doctor, all of a sudden they lose all this weight, their diabetes is better, they don't need blood pressure medication anymore, whatever. And just this astounding recovery in a patient that was just had just been getting worse, worse, worse. And that's what we do, we just manage their, their diabetes, they worse, 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 and they die. And you just try to slow down the rate at which they lose their vision, and they lose their kidney function, and they lose their lower limbs. I mean, that's, that's all we can do is die. I mean, thought. Then all of a sudden, there's this miraculous reversal of disease, and the doctor's thinking in the back of my way, saying, I've got a thousand patients just like you. What did you do? And they said, oh, there's this great documentary I said, you gotta check it out. And then they see it, and all of a sudden they change their whole practice. And all of a sudden they have a lifestyle medicine practice, because this is why they went to medicine. Because, uh, you know, if you want to just make money, you go to the stock market, right? People go into medicine, at first, at least, as young, idealistic people that want to help people, that want to take care of sick people. And all of a sudden, you can reignite that spark that led them to the medicine first. And people are actually getting better, like laying hands, jumping out of wheelchairs. It's a beautiful day. Um, and so, so, so that, so, so whenever they're like, you know, so whenever people say, I really, you know, I, I want my, I wish I had a doctor with plant face. I'm like, oh yeah, I know, but come on, go back to your other doctor, and just show them what they can do. I mean, because all the science in the world. Just for some reason, some quirk of human psychology, all the science in the world you know, may not stack up against a single anecdote, a single story, a single person that they knew, they know the family, and all of a sudden they see it before their own eyes. Uh, even though I can show the data, they see it before their own eyes, and that really can, can affect them. So, anyway, so we should just put it um, And in terms of uh, some of these organizations, I think the, the, the documentary I mentioned, What the Health, is a good job of explaining why. The American Diabetes Association, American Heart Association, are not more are not the ones leading the fight in this area. And all you have to do is you look at a funding point. Okay? Um, and the who funds the American Heart Association? In fact, one of their I forget they their gold funders or the top two. I forget the name of them. Coca Cola. Like that was like the, the, that's who funded. And so they had Coca Cola on the website, and they were all like you know. Um, and so it's like, is the American Heart Association going to tell them not drink Coke? Of course you're not going to drink. I mean, they got hundreds of thousands of dollars. And of course, why is Coke giving to it? That's exactly why. You know what I mean? So, and it's just, and that's really disappointing. And look, the American Heart Association does really good stuff. They tell people to cut down their salt. You know, okay, great. Um, until, of course, the salt industry gets a little bit. But, you know, so far so good. Um, so, uh, so what that means is we you know, leads us to us, you know, our, at, at, you know, within our own practices, to, to, to stick with the science and educate ourselves. Um, and it's sad because literally lives are in the balance and uh, it's not happening fast enough. Hello. Uh, first, I want to say I look forward every month to your uh, Q&As on your treadmill. Uh, Thank funny. you for that. Hmm. And today's my two-year plant-based anniversary and I thought, what better way than to see uh, you? Wonderful. Uh, but my question is, and the one thing I'm Okay, so um, great question. In fact, I have a whole series of videos coming out on iodine. Um, uh, and uh, so iodine is an essential mineral that we all need. Um, and it's found uh, and it's found in the soil. So some crops, so if it's found in the soil, the crops pick it up. Uh, but the problem is it's found irregularly in soil. So for example, in Northern Europe, the soil just doesn't have a lot of iodine. And so if you just ate locally in Northern Europe, you wouldn't have um, you know, like one thing or another thing. So now, we, I mean, we typically you go to the grocery store, and stuff is coming from all over the world, so the hope is you're getting enough iodine. But particularly for pregnant women, because then it's really serious. You don't need, just need iodine for one, you need iodine for two. There can be really serious consequences of, uh, of not having enough iodine for a um, And so, particularly for pregnant women and breastfeeding women, you really need to make sure you're getting enough iodine. Not just, well, I'm eating plants from around the world and probably one of them's being grown in good soil. Who knows, right? Um, uh, which most people get away with. I mean, most people don't think about iodine, but pregnant women should think about iodine. Um, and so you then you just need a source that you know is a good source. And the most concentrated source on the planet is sea vegetables. Suck it out of the sea water. Um, and so I, so I suggest, as like a, as a, like a snack, you can eat these nori sheets. You know, that they make sushi out of, but you can get a 50-pack, 
and you chew on, and it's just like a snack. And you're like snacking on dark green leafy vegetables. Like, what? I'm eating greens as a snack. Okay. Um, yeah, like kids love them. Okay. Some people don't love them. Okay. Fine. Look. No, no, no. You know, I mean, look. You know, you know, you, know, you can whiten up or anything for a little while, but if it's going to be sustainable, you have to enjoy it. It's being convenient. It's such a fit into your lifestyle. So if you just don't like moisture, there's other, um, I encourage people to, before completely giving up on seaweed, to experiment around, so dulse flakes. Um, uh, it's this purple seaweed that comes in little flakes, you sprinkle it on stuff. It's a very unseaweedy seaweed, very, very mild. Probably won't even taste it. And I forget, I did a video, you'll see in the video, it's a really, it's like a quarter teaspoon a day or something, really not a lot. So a little shake you have at the table, just randomly shaking it all the I don't need. Um, uh, Arme is this nice, like, uh, noodle-like sea vegetable that's good for soups. Um, let's see the one Oh, okay. And then, all right, well, I'm getting down. I always start with the whole foods, all right? Okay. Now, if you're, but if you just, for whatever reason, right, um, then, yes, you take 150 micrograms, like, three times a week, get all the energy you need, you can get a pill, get a multivitamin. Um, just, I would not recommend getting a kelp tablet. Many natural iodine supplements are just little compressed pieces of kelp. Um, powdered kelp compressed into a pill. The kelp is a sea vegetable, but the problem is, depending on what the kelp was doing that day, it could have a lot of iodine, it could have less iodine, it's not standardized. And so, and you can actually get too much iodine, so, you know, if you just, if they just, you know, uh, the company just adds iodine to it, then you know it's... Presumably. And, and if you've got it by any supplements, ideally you get what's called USP certified, um, which doesn't mean that it's good for you. All it means is that what's inside the bottle is actually what's on the label. Of course, it could be like arsenic on the label, arsenic in the thing. Then it's USP certified. They don't care. Right? And they certify all sorts of crazy stuff. But they're just like, yeah, but the crazy stuff on the label is the crazy stuff in the pill. Right? Which, unfortunately, given the poor, like, poor regulation of supplements being taste, is not a guarantee at all that what's actually in the thing is actually on the thing. So, um, yeah, so you can do that first come from worst, and particularly important for pregnant women. Yes? Hello. Uh, hi. Oh, lighting my eyeballs. Oh, yes. My turn. <laughs> oh, yeah, great. Wow. Okay, um... I've seen a lot of uh, research on plant-based nutrition and rheumatoid arthritis, but I was wondering if there is much for osteoarthritis. Ooh, there's yes. It affects with osteoarthritis. Yes, there is. So I actually um, have a little section on um, osteoarthritis in the new book. Um, and so we used to think osteoarthritis was kind of a wear and tear disease. Where, so basically osteoarthritis is that the cartilage cushion between your bones and your joints, particularly the knees, get worn away, um, and then it gets it, it worn away at a faster rate than your body can build back up. So normally it gets worn away all the time, but we just make more. So, but if it's it worn away faster, then it gets too thin, and it can cause pain. Okay. Um, and so we used to think we just wear and tear, particularly because obesity is the, the number one uh, risk factor. The heavier you are, the more likely you get osteoarthritis. Very common. And in fact, as I talk about in the book, uh, so what happens is worse and worse get knee replacement surgery. Very serious surgery. Um, and uh, I forget the mortality rate after knee replacement surgery, but there's something ridiculous. Like one in 500 people don't wake up. Like that's bad. All right? And it's done hundreds of thousands. So like thousands of people are dying from knee replacement surgery. Anyway. Um, but, uh, but, but, um, uh, but I forget how many pounds you lose. Um, it's the equivalent of knee replacement surgery. Like you lose 15 pounds, and it's as if you just got knee replacement surgery. Uh, in terms of uh, disability, in terms of pain, everything works just as good. Um, and so obviously it just has good side effects, etc. Et okay. But that that was kind of the old way of thinking. The reason is because you cannot get osteoarthritis, arthritis in non-weak bearing joints, like your fingers, in your wrists. So wait a second. It doesn't matter how fat, how fat can your finger possibly be, right? And so, wait, so maybe it's not just mechanical wear and tear. And, and in fact, you stick a needle in, you pull out all these um, inflammatory mediators. So it actually is an inflammatory arthritis, like rheumatoid arthritis. And so wait a second. If it's an inflammatory disease, we have an inflammatory diet. diet. An anti-inflammatory diet is synonymous with a plant-based diet. 
Um, and indeed, when you put people, randomize them to plant-based diet or not, you get significant improvements in osteoarthritis, even without weight loss. Um, and so, yeah, it's the same diet, it's the same thing, um, uh, and it works for osteoarthritis. I have an uncle who just, uh, he was just treat, treated for leukemia, and he survived. Right? He's a survivor. It's wonderful. Well, how effective is a plant-based diet for somebody in that situation, like a, a cancer survivor or a leukemia survivor or some type of terrible disease like that? It, would it prevent any kind of relapse? Like, would it help with immensely? So for most types of cancer, the answer is we don't know. It's never been put to the test. So the only two cancers we have reversal data on are prostate cancer and breast cancer. There are dietary interventions that can prolong survival in breast cancer and actually reverse cancer growth um, in, in prostate cancer. Um, but that's the extent. Now, all beyond that, we have epidemiological studies, population studies, that show that, for example, people with lung cancer eat more broccoli tend to live longer than the people with the same kind of lung cancer who don't eat broccoli. That doesn't prove broccoli made them live longer. People who eat broccoli have all sorts of other healthy behaviors. Um, and so maybe because they're also exercising so we try to control for that. We want intervention trials. You randomize people, you eat this diet, you eat this diet, let's see who drops dead first. That's the kind of, that, that we can actually prove cause and effect. And that it has not been done um, for the vast majority of cancers. Um, and so all we can say is, it's not going to hurt, to support your body, to, sir, um, to put up with the, the conventional, you know, uh, uh, chemo radiation surgery. Um, and prevent all the other things. So, for example, um, and this was actually shocking to me, and it's hard to shock me. I've become quite cynical over the years. But postmenopausal breast cancer um, patients diagnosed postmenopausal breast cancer, at least most breast cancer, um, number one cause of death is not breast cancer. Number one cause of death of women with breast cancer still heart disease. Still heart disease. You're more likely to die from your heart, from heart disease you don't even know you have than the active cancer you have in your body. <laughs> and so, whether or not a plant-based diet helps with that particular type of breast cancer you have doesn't matter because it reverses the, 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 the cause of death that you're more likely to die from heart disease. Um, and so that's why it's always good to be on a healthy diet to put, help your body best support itself through whatever crisis comes through. Um, you know, it's like it's like asking, you know, is getting enough sleep good for this particular disease? I mean, we don't know. No one's actually tried it. But like, that'd be a good idea, right? To just support your body, to do healthy things for your body. Are you smoking bad for this disease? Maybe it's never been tested, but probably not a great idea. Whether or not it hurts that particular disease or not, right? We're just talking about a healthy diet. But I totally hear you. You'd like to be able to go to your uncle and be like, here's the study that shows you're going to live 4.5 years longer. Study hasn't been done, right? But instead, you can give them this overwhelming body of evidence saying this is the healthy side, it's such a support for body. Yeah. And so all these other cancers in my work um, well again. Uh, but, yeah, unfortunately. Yes? Dr. Gregor, uh, about Reiki, and uh, before I ask the last question, I want to thank you very much for uh, coming to Michigan on behalf of all of us in Michigan. Oh, one more after me, sorry, okay. Um, you come to Michigan and, and your excellent presentation. Um, now, as a family doc, of course, I deal with this very commonly. And I start, uh, they want assistance starting to calorie density, microbiome, and they cut me off. I say, no, no, doc, I already eat healthy. I just need to exercise more. And can you help me with that two-minute evidence-based yeah. approach to helping them understand? Yeah, no, no, that's fantastic. In fact, that's exactly what the food industry wants them to think. In fact, the CEO of Pepsi-Cola said we would have no obesity if everybody just exercised. And Coca-Cola went one step worse and created the Global Ballot Energy Balance Network, which is this pseudoscientific body. I mean, they hid their money and it was later exposed. But it was this group of scientists that said it's all about inequity. It's all about the... It's all about the energy out, not what you eat. Oh, and by the way, you see, we secretly funded by Coca-Cola all the while. Okay. Um, but that, that and, and it's worked. That amazing propaganda machine. You ask people, 
Um, what do you think? Most people say um, it's balanced. Right? Energy in is just as exercise is just as important as diet. And then the second most uh, popular answer is exercise is more important than diet. Right? And so the vast majority of people are simply dead wrong. And one easy way you can explain it to them that explain why you cannot outrun a bad diet is just simple math. An average, uh, a moderately obese person, moderately vigorously exercising, like biking really hard for an hour, uh, it's kind of, you can go through about 350 calories. Right? The average um, calorie intake per minute for typical snacks, processed food, 70 calories a minute. In five minutes, hmm. you just wiped out an entire hour of exercise. It just shows how how completely one-sided it is. Um, and then if there's a really science-minded person, you talk about how we have total control over calories in. I mean, you could eat no calories if you wanted to. Whereas the calories out, the, 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 the you know, kind of the elective energy uh, exercise, it's just a team of little slice. Most of the calories we burn throughout the day, we have no power over. It's resting metabolic rate. If we lie in bed all day, it's completely still, we still burn most of the calories that we burn. More, more than 50%, just keeping our brain going, our heart pumping. That's a, so most of our calories are completely out of our hands in terms of, um, uh, unless you're like, you know, there's some, you know, uh, some articles on mountain climbers and on the range, there's people that just extreme at, and exertion. They can actually um, lose weight like, pretty effectively. But for most people, exercising, you know, um, that, it's just no... No comparison. Now, exercise super important for all sorts of other reasons. Even if it's not really going to help your weight as much, super healthy, super healthy, important for all sorts of other things. So, absolutely need to exercise, but we just cannot count on it uh, to affect the weight. And, and then really, it's sad because people expect it to work, and then they're like, "I'm a failure. My body is biochemically. There's something wrong with me. I've exercised, started exercising, I'm still not losing weight." Um, on the flip side, people that for some reason they get an injury and they stop exercising, they think, oh my god, I'm going to gain all this weight. They really don't want to gain much weight. Even though they're like, wait a second, I'm not exercising, I'm not gaining weight. And it's the same kind of thing. It's just really, it's more kind of what's going on in that. And for the last question, one last, wanna, one last question over here. And before the last question, I just want to say, if you like this presentation, I will be back here in Michigan in May for the Veg Fest, giving this exact same talk. And so, if you're sitting here thinking, oh, I wish my friend, family member, whatever, could see this stuff, bring them in May. All right, last question. Hi, Dr. Greger. I'm Kirsten Dallison, and I'm internal medicine. Woo! So I'm really happy to see you. I listen to your podcast and your presentations on nutrition tech catalog all the time. I agree with what you said. I feel like often I'm on a desert island when I talk to my patients about plant-based nutrition because their own physician or other physicians tell you there's no no evidence or there's no reason for that or um, they recommend keto diets or something called clean meat, which I don't really understand what that is. <laughs> That's not even my question. I just wanted to echo my frustration with my day-to-day -day living on a desert island sometimes. And thank God that you're, you have some lucky patients, I tell you. Oh, hi. <laughs> Our, what my question is about intermittent fasting. There was a recent review article in the New England Journal of Medicine about intermittent fasting. Can you comment on this on my list? Yeah, no, so actually the biggest uh, chapter in my book is on intermittent fasting, just because there's so many different types. I wanted to go through every single one of them. So it's alternate day fasting, it's time restricted feeding, there's 5 2 fast and 5 by 5 go through all of them. Um, and kind of the takeaways um, are. Um, wa uh, so water only fasting, uh, so complete water only fasting, first of all, it's not safe to do it for, for 24, 48 hours without physician supervised supervision, and even under su uh, physician supervision, supervision is a terrible way to lose weight. You actually lose less weight completely on uh, water only fasting than you do eating uh, probably calories a day, which doesn't make a lot of sense. You can watch it in the and say, oh, I understand all that. Um, but, uh, so I have videos on that um, on the site. Um, alternate day fasting, the longest, largest study um, ever done on alternate day fasting found a significant increase in cholesterol compared to the continuous caloric restriction group. So um, if you are going to do alternate day fasting, 
First of all, they found no benefits in terms of lean body mass preservation, bone preservation, or compliance, or nothing. But if you like it for whatever reason, make sure you get your cholesterol test and make sure that it doesn't go up like most um, patients did in the study. The one type um, uh, that uh, I would consider safe and effective would be early time-restricted feeding. So um, this is body of evidence on restricting your eating window to under 12 hours a day. So most of us um, eat um, like 15 hours um, a day. But so, so just cutting it down so that we're fasting 12 hours a day, most of, the, most of which while we're sleeping. Um, and it was really interesting. When I looked at that literature, it's all over the place. So half the studies show it's terrible for you. Half the studies show it's amazing for you. And I was just like, what am I down at? You know, so only when you dig deep do you realize, ah, that's what's going on. Late um, uh, time restricted feeding, meaning you skip breakfast and you have a late eating window, is bad for you. Metabolically bad, thanks to chronobiology, our circadian rhythms. Food eaten at night is more fattening than the exact same food eaten earlier in the day. The fewer calories after sundown, the better. So you use time restricted feeding late, you, you know, only start eating at noon or something. Uh, that's bad and has negative metabolic consequences, even with the time restriction. However, early time restricted feeding, meaning you have a bit, you, you front load your calories towards the day, big as breakfast as possible, and make the supper the smallest meal or no meal at all if you're going to skip any breakfast, any meal, you'll be skipping supper, not breakfast. Um, the more calories you can front load, the better. Um, and then you get twin benefits of not only the time restricted feeding, but the chronobiological benefits of eating calories earlier in the day, which are better for blood sugars, better for cholesterol, better for weight um, loss. Um, and so, yeah, early time restricted eating. And that's one of the things in the book that actually changed my, um, not that I'm just uh, concerned about weight, but in terms of metabolic impacts. So now I try to eat more calories earlier in the day, unless I get out of a really long book signing. <coughs> So, thank you so much for the last question. professional and impressive artwork from scratch that will blow people's minds. I love being here. I love seeing you guys. This is such a good time for all of us. But I want to introduce somebody. You know, I, I, I tag people as plant-based heroes because to me, you know, my story is a story. There's a million great stories. There's nothing really special about me and the past. And I get to see and meet so many people who I sit there and go, oh, that was a great story. You know, that is amazing. Well, today, you get to meet one of my personal plant-based heroes. And I'd like to introduce my dear friend, my plant-based hero, Joyce Hill. Come on up here, please. Ladies and gentlemen, Joyce Hill. Okay. <laughs> I have a mic. Okay.
So the first thing that came to mind, potentially trauma, my parents had been in a car accident with me when my mother was eight months pregnant. And although she was wearing her seatbelt, she did go into the windshield. They did not find my heartbeat or hers for quite a long time. So the fact that she was able to finish carrying me to term, they found that as a miracle, but they were still concerned at how sick I was. And the fact that it was no longer trauma, because as time went on, I continued to be sick. So I received the label, sickly child, which is something they used back then, it's an easy label, and they questioned if I liked school. My parents knew that that was not the case. I loved school, I had good grades, I loved my teachers, and over time, I didn't grow out of it. So as a teen, I was still sick, so now is that just growing pains, or is something more going on with this child? And then unfortunately, as I went off to college, I was still sick. In fact, I was prostrated. It was becoming very confusing, and I'm sure frustrating to my parents, but none of the doctors could figure out why I was continually sick. And when my friends would get sick, I had something that would linger, and I would end up in the hospital. So in comes tests and specialists to try and figure out what is happening. Unfortunately, doctor after doctor, no one's able to figure out why is this woman so ill. And unfortunately, this is about the time that I start hearing, perhaps it's all in your head. And I know that there are patients out there that have heard this as they have been on their diagnosis discovery tour and a doctor can't figure things out, they get frustrated, and that's an easy go-to, at least it was back then. It definitely wasn't all in my head, but the diagnosis was very elusive to them. And finding that diagnosis was really important, so we need to just really understand and the truth that it wasn't all in my head. Years ago, there was a TV show, House. I fell in love with this show, not just for the drama of it, but here it was, week after week, patient after patient, that seemed so familiar to me, that doctors were throwing away, doctors couldn't figure out what was going on, and this gave me hope, because here was a team of people that were willing to put the hard work in, and even though they made some missteps along the way, they made it their mission to figure out what was wrong with this person and get them their life back. Now, there was an underlying theme in the show that I found kind of humorous, which was that whenever a team member said, Dr. House's response was, it's not lupus. It's never lupus. There was only one episode in which it was. And for me, that is exactly what the diagnosis was. I had lupus, and I didn't know what to do with that diagnosis. I had never heard of it before. So my big mission at that point was, okay, what do I do? The internet wasn't around, so I could call home and Google it, which probably would not have been a good idea from what I found out since. But I did a lot of reading. I asked a lot of questions. And all the people around me were asking questions about what is this lupus and how do we make sense of it and what do we do? <laughs> so the easiest thing for me was to find a way that I could identify with the disease and explain it to people around me that were concerned. And on the left side of the screen is what I was told a normal immune response was. That when the body is um, encountering some sort of bacterial infection or viral infection, the body knows to send antibodies to attack that foreign invader. I, however, was on the right side of the screen, and that was when the antibodies were sent out, it may or may not get to bacterial infection, it may or may not get to a viral infection, but it was going to attack its own tissue. It couldn't differentiate one from the other. And a doctor explained to me that I could potentially have a sunburn on my hand, but my kidneys could be attacked by my own body. So it didn't even have to be in close proximity, but in this illustration. In fact, they explained that it was systemic and it's a chronic disease, that any organ could be attacked, any system within the body could be attacked. And in fact, from flare to flare, it could be a variety of these, in fact, combinations. And I've had every single system and every organ attacked, and some of my flares were weird combinations. And in hindsight, that is probably why it is so difficult for the doctors, because every time I presented, I presented with different symptoms that didn't match the last time I had gone there complained about what was wrong with me. The hardest thing to hear was that there is not a cure or a dedicated treatment plan. So what the doctors do when you go in with the symptoms, they find medications for another condition that has similar symptoms, and they, pre they prescribe that medication for you. And when you go in the next time with a new set of symptoms, you could, could potentially still be on that same drug, and now they give you another one. 
and another one in San Diego where you eventually have a cocktail of medication. Mm -hmm. I have friends that have been on 20 different types of medications at a time. I too had a long list of medications. If any of you have watched the ads on TV, there is also what happens on the right side of the screen, which is all the side effects that come from those medications. And quite honestly, some of the times when I went in, I might have been complaining about something that was happening to my lupus. Sometimes I could have been complaining about what was happening with this particular medication going on inside of me and all of the side effects I was having. And pharmacists had said that it's really hard for them when they're, when they're filling these prescriptions because you don't know what interactions are happening, especially when you're putting it in a body that can't differentiate good from bad, can't metabolize all this, and all these chemicals are swirling around inside that sick body. But wait, there's hope. Something really cool happened in March of 2011. It was the first drug in 50 years that was approved for lupus. Now it says here that it was developed for lupus, but it wasn't. Kind of like the previous slide, it was actually being tested for another uh, condition, and they felt that it did well enough for lupus patients. There were a lot of medications in the pipeline for lupus that were being studied at the time, and to get the bragging rights to be the first one in 50 years, this company went for it. Now internally, their educational material was a little bit different than the cute marketing slide that they had there. The most important thing on here is that they had two large files. And what they found is there was a reduction in the disease activity that was 14% versus 9% of the placebo. That's a 5% difference from the placebo, and it's only 14%. And that is what they went to market claiming huge bragging rights to be the first drug in 15 years for a 14% reduction of the disease activity. Now, the howevers are really great out here because they do say that the magnitude of the benefit is modest. I personally think 14% is just a little bit lower than modest. I'm going to go with mild at best, but it went to market. It's also not indicated for the most severe cases, and those are the ones with kidney involvement and central nervous system involvement. Those are the patients that are having the most debilitating form of the disease, and those are the patients that need the most care, and this is not designed for them. And it's costly. Costly is an understatement. Costly is ten to twelve thousand dollars billed per dose. This is a monthly infusion, and the kickoff period for a new patient on it is every other week for the first three dosages at ten to twelve thousand dollars per dose. <laughs> and here I am receiving my first dose. And yes, I did say that I had every system, every system, and every organ attacked. I was a patient that had kidney involvement and I had central nervous system involvement. And yet I still was put on this medication even though it wasn't designed for me. I had rejected every medication before that, ended up in the hospital because of the medications that they gave me. My doctors realized there was no more hope for me unless they tried this knowing full well that I should have been excluded from this. So then the question I get asked, how desperate can you be? to know that you're excluded from that drug and you took it anyway. I had skin lesions, literally the whole side of my face that would take two to three hours a day to cleanse and medicate. I was quarantined because that would be a whole day of open raw wounds and I couldn't be around anybody risking a further infection. My hair fell out, I had heart involvement. I had been in the cardiac wing numerous times admitted that I'd never had a cardiac episode. My lungs had been attacked to the point where one time I was in the infectious Word with two types of pneumonia, whooping cough, and chloroquine. That is how bad my lungs had been attacked. My kidneys, my eyes. I was a photo major. I had a scholarship for my photography, and I could no longer focus a camera or even hold it on some days. My blood vessels, my central nervous system were like this, and that was daily multiple seizures and neuropathy that made me grab onto a wall when I tried to walk down the hallway. I had cartilage loss, and I had bone deterioration to the point where the left side of my jaw completely disintegrated and needed to be rebuilt. Now this is a better picture to look at because the other one's a little ugly, but basically what happened is the condyle completely disintegrated and I was told that it looked like a melted ice cream cone. And in order for them to give me any function back and allow me to open my mouth because it was suddenly locked almost closed, they had to take a rib bone and a titanium plate and build a whole new left side of my face. It was a nine-hour surgery 